Just because he didn't want to be outdone, the Reverend William Barber of the NAACP of North Carolina calls the only black Republican senator in the Senate a big old dummy. Why must we compete in all the wrong ways in the public forum? Talking about that next on Get Right with Lenny McAllister, starting right now. Get Right with Lenny McAllister. You big dummy! The way we help bring back America and we build the bridges and bring people together is by making sure we hold everybody accountable in a 360 fashion. So let me close with this. Yes, there is a change that we can believe in, but it will never come from a politician or a government program. We gotta move away from the American Idol soundbite nature of politics and back to the American statesman of humble servant leadership that we used to see in politics. It is time to roll out the era of the new American citizen. If we could continue to get some common sense government from both sides of the aisle, we finally get Americans through the recession, not just Wall Street. We need people that could change the crisis that we're seeing, and that's why, as a proud Republican, I go to the jail ministry. I speak to the kids in the streets, so I'm never going to lay down being a Republican or being a conservative, just as much as I'll never lay down being a proud African American. I feel like a black public money I got coming in. Welcome to the Wednesday the edition of Get Right with Lenny McAllister. You know who this is. It's Lenny McAllister. You know where to find me on Twitter. It's L-E-N-N-Y-M-C-A-L-L-I-S. T E R on Facebook, you know the deal. Two walls, same guy, same name, same opportunity to share your opinion. I appreciate the emails. I appreciate the Twitter back and forth. I appreciate the times that you actually do put something on Facebook. It is all good. I appreciate it very, very much. Now, what am I talking about in regards to this competition? Well, it's very, very simple. We just talked about this yesterday. We just talked about Joshua Black yesterday. We just sat here and talked about the articles. By the way, at the time it was just The Root, which is a subsidiary for African-American readership from The Washington Post. And yes, it leans to the left. So one could argue that black Republicans say something crazy about President Obama, go over the line, talk about hanging him by the neck until dead. And even though he didn't really say that, he agreed with a crazy tweet, which if you're running for public office, which Mr. Black is, he's running for the General Assembly in Florida. So he's going to, if he wins, he's going to be a state House representative in one of the most populated states in the United States, an all-important swing state. So he gets to conceivably write election law if he were to win in November. So this is not a guy that's just flippantly going to be your next dog catcher, scooping up poop on the sidewalk. This is a guy that, if he were to win in November, would actually affect laws that could actually impact the nation. You think that's not the case? You think I'm going a little bit of hyperbole, if you will? 2000. I hear Democrats screaming right now. Bush v. Gore. So uh, that's all I want to say about this. So anywho, we talked about this yesterday. This guy steps over the line, agrees with a tweet that says that President Obama should be hung for treason, and he doubled down on it, basically. So, in order to up the ante, if you will, and again, all of these wonderful public African-American public figures, political figures, civic figures, you got to just love this, and all the wrong ways to compete. We could be competing with ideas. We could be pushing each other to be better. We could be competing to make the black community, particularly those that are suffering in the black community, particularly during this recession, I mean recovery, we could help make people's lives better. Instead, we compete like this. So as Joshua Black is agreeing with crazy tweets and then trying to double down and say, I didn't mean it, but I really did mean it because President Obama's a commie. Um, I mean, he's a Muslim. Um, I mean, he's a treasonous. You wretched dog, um, I mean, I don't like him. I told you about that Twitter juice. Well, while that's happening, you got somebody that's on Jerry Curl Juice. And I, anybody, if you've been in North Carolina for like 15 seconds, you kind of know what's going on with William Barber. If you've listened to the interviews that he has given on this since he said this statement, you kind of know what's going on with the Reverend William Barber. So you have, for those of you that don't know, 
The Reverend William Barber is the head of the NAACP in the state of North Carolina, was having moral Mondays in order to protest what was going on within the state government of the state of North Carolina down in the Tar Heel State. Okay, that's fine. But he sits there and makes this statement, calling the only black Republican senator in Lord knows how long. Actually, I know. The Lord isn't the only person that knows. I do. It's Edward, Edward Brook out of Massachusetts. But besides that point, that's in the 60s, by the way, when he first got elected. Besides that point, it's been 50 years. He ends up calling him a big dummy and that any ventriloquist can go find a dummy to parrot their talking points. What? First of all, I don't even know where to go with this. So I'll try. Number one, again... I've already said this. Why are we competing like this as black people? And I know for those of you, and not everybody that listens to me is black. I get that. I understand that. I appreciate people from all different walks of life listening to Get Right with Lenny McAllister or following me in digital print or following me when I do interviews on television. So thank you. Appreciate that very, very much. However, with, with that said, I'm speaking specifically to black people at this point in time. And as a public figure myself, I feel as though I have the right to at least ask this question. Why are we competing like this as black people in 2014 when we have as many problems as we do within our community collectively? When it comes to health care, when it comes to education, when it comes to unemployment, when it comes to losing wealth during this recession, or er, I mean recovery. Sorry, President Obama. I know the recession ended in 2009. <laughs> Supposedly, allegedly. <clears throat> Anywho, aside from that, why are we doing that? that that's number one. It, that kind of irks me. Number two, and again, your feedback on Twitter or Facebook, I appreciate it as always. Number two, as I sit here on hump day, as I sit here on Wednesday, and I listen to this, and I listen to the Reverend William Barber, who, by the way, wasn't exactly being a Christian by just calling Tim Scott who accomplished something that no other black Republican had done in 50 years, including, you know, Alan West and Alan Keyes and Michael Steele. I mean, it's a notable accomplishment. We've only had, what, seven black senators since the 60s? I mean, Edward, Edward Brooke, Barack Obama, Carol Mosley Brown. Three of them came from one state, by the way. So let's take out the Chicago three, and let's go from there. Then you only have Scott, you have Brooke, you have Booker, and you had the gentleman that sat in up in Massachusetts for a hot second. So that's it. That's all you got. So that is an accomplishment. So to call him, here's my thing. To say that he's a ventriloquist dummy and insult him like that, and then, and here's my, here it, here it goes, and then from there to hear Reverend William Barber, which, by the way, it's not, again, it wasn't the Christian thing to do. He hasn't offered any type of olive branch. He hasn't tried to sit down with the senator. He hasn't tried to craft any solutions on the other side of the aisle other than to criticize. But then from there, and, and yes, you can criticize, but if you're in that position to be a leader, you also have an obligation to reach out and build solutions, broker deals. The NAACP didn't just sue the government. It also said in, in, in the process of having redress, this is what needs to transpire. You're discriminating against blacks for not having equal educational facilities for young black children. So, one, this is against the Constitution because the Constitution says separate but equal. So they say that's wrong. But then they brought a redress. They brought a solution to the redress, I should say. They said, basically, that the only solution to redress this situation is to get rid of separate but equal because there's no possible way in this regard to have separate schools and equal education. Just it's not going to happen. Not going to have equal facilities. Not going to have equal access to books. Not going to have equal access to quality teachers, especially on the public dole, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So to that point, you do, and there, you can go to other examples as well. You can criticize, but you're also supposed to bring about a solution. Now, of course, you may say, well, why don't you do that now? Well, because it's a podcast. Can't you say I'm contained in this? Anywho. <laughs> With that said, and, and there are times I do, and I will, I promise you, I will eventually, but I'm going to get to this point with William Barber. You cannot accuse Tim Scott of being a ventriloquist dummy for the Tea Party and then 
parrot off the talking points for the Democratic Party over and over and over and over and over again every time somebody sees you in the media. You cannot read off the same piece of paper that is so old and so faded that it has like seven folds in it and it's ripped in the middle because it's the same it's the same script that you take around to CNN and MSNBC and Fox News and several local radio stations and the local TV station. And Cousin Henry that's on the corner with a Digicam and the flip phone and, and his little pocket phone for, with his S4. I, you cannot do that. You cannot pair it off the talking points from the Democratic Party and then accuse a black Republican of being – a dummy for the ventriloquist of the Tea Party or the ventriloquist that is the Koch brothers or Americans for Prosperity or Freedom Works or whatever other boogeyman that you want to grab. Now, I'm not saying that every organization on the left or the right is either 100% pure or 100% evil. What I'm saying, though, is when you're trying to make the point and say that Tim Scott is just parroting talking points and then you repute that, you rebuke that, you go after that, you debate that, you argue that point by, in your own right, saying talking points from the other side. It nullifies your argument. It makes this just a farce. And to me, and this is the third point I want to make, agree or disagree, when people look at black leaders in America, they expect this type of silly arguing as if we are constantly dealing with adolescence type of just conversations, bickering, madness, as you see madness in the streets, as you see madness in healthcare, as you see madness when it comes to the double unemployment rate. These are things, you know, and, and this is what I'm talking about. Again, agree or disagree, you know where to find me on Twitter and where to find me on Facebook. This is my point with this. If you're the Reverend William Barber and you're the head of a statewide organization that is the oldest civil rights organization in the United States of America and the model for those, I mean, it's really the model organization for those that actually try to fight for civil rights around the world. They look at what the NAACP had done over the years. How do they attack the law? How do they protest? How do they have civil disobedience? How do they win? If you're a leader within that legacy, you have an obligation to reach out to Senator Scott and try to broker some type of agreement. And yeah, I will say that it's, it's both sides. And trust me, anybody that's seen me write over the last six years now, publicly, digital print, uh, traditional print, television, whatever else, you've seen me say this same argument to black Republicans concerning the black community. You cannot sit there and say, why do they hate me? You have to go love them anyway, deal with them, give solutions, make tangible arguments, craft the message to the black community, particularly the black disadvantaged community, and when what you say out of the can does not work, modify it so it does while keeping your conservative principles. Something that I have said for years, so this is not me just parroting talking points like a ventriloquist dummy, if you will, to those on the left. But there is a very legitimate case to be made that when William Barber, Reverend, takes a very unchristian tone trying to call out somebody for speaking off talking points and then parrots talking points from the other side on his own from the same worn out script that we've heard for years that hasn't moved the needle on anything other than getting people riled up for election time. And let's be honest. Let's be honest. It's a big election year. In North Carolina, the Democrats, and, and for those of you who are saying, no, he's just doing because it's Moral Monday and he's moral and he's a reverend, by the way. Well, the, those that will say that also disrespect Reverend Jesse Jackson. They disrespect Farrakhan from time to time until they're actually in Chicago on the south side. And they got to deal with the fruit of Islam. And there are people that will disrespect the Reverend Al Sharpton, among other reverends. So please back up off that for just a second when you start coming to the Moral Mondays aspect of this argument. Let's be in the real with this as well. There is a big set of elections coming up in North Carolina in 2014. Number one, there's a Senate race. The Democrats do not want to lose control of the Senate. One of the most vulnerable senators in the U.S. Senate, Kay Hagan, out of North Carolina, with Tom Tillis, Speaker of the House of the North Carolina House of Representatives, right on her heels, raising money, 
He's the presumptive nominee. He's a moderate Republican that can win statewide, much like Pat McCrory did in 2012. The Democrats nationally know about this race. You think there's not a little bit of pressure that may have been applied to Reverend Barber? Hey, you know, you got some stuff going on down there. If you raise a ruckus, if you bring some attention to North Carolina on the issues that you're passionate about, we will catch your back. Now, I'm not saying they're manufacturing the passion, but what I am saying is this is a political opportunity, and this is how political operatives work. They see something organically start, and as it grows, they see the opportunity to jump on board, and something that may have only had a 1,000 people involved all of a sudden has 10,000 people involved because other organizations outside of the area bust people in. And they may not just be doing it for, quote-unquote, Moral Monday. They're also doing it for election night in November. So let's just be clear. Some of this is about Election Tuesday, not just Moral Monday. If you agree or disagree, you know where to find me on social media. That's not the only race that's important. Let's step outside the, the federal race, the Senate race. Now, of course, you always have congressional races going on from time to time. And yes, in North Carolina, which has become a purple state, you can look at red areas and go get a conservative Democrat to win that if the numbers suggest that, which would help. The Democrats chip away at the lead in the House of Representatives, which if you do that in enough states, you can make Nancy Pelosi the Speaker of the House once again or somebody else. But let's move away from the congressional races. Let's move away from the Senate race in North Carolina in 2014. Democrats control the North Carolina General Assembly basically from the turn of the 20th century until 2010. And by the way, yes, I know for all the black conservatives out there that want to remind everybody, I will go ahead and do the disclaimer. Just to let you know that is also basically covering the whole end of Reconstruction, all of Jim Crow, the rise of the Klan, part one and part two, and all the stuff that all the black people went through in the South, in North Carolina, throughout the 50s and 60s with the Civil Rights Movement. Yes, that is true. The Democrats are running North Carolina throughout all that period of time. I get that. It's out there. Everybody should know that by now, but that's not the reason why I bring that up. The reason why I bring that up is because there's no political party that's going to control cities, Raleigh, other than um, Tom Fetzer being the mayor there a couple of years ago. They're not going to control Charlotte, Democratic mayor, Asheville, eastern North Carolina, the the towns and the cities out there. You're not going to control state government for over 100 years. You're not going to go through this period of time where you have a Republican governor basically once every 30 years. Before Pat McCrory in 2012, the last Republican governor was James Martin from my alma mater of Davidson College. But that was when Reagan was in office. Think about how many Republican presidents we had from Reagan through Bush to even if you want to count Obama. Count the Republican presidents during that period of time and you only had one Republican governor. From the time Reagan took office and started office, Martin came in, I think, in 80, might have come in in 80 as well. I think he came in in 84, though. So think about that. You're a political party. You're used to controlling the governor's mansion. You're used to controlling the House of Representatives. You're used to, which means you control the Speaker of the House. And you generally have the State Senate, which, by the way, That means access to lobbyists. That means access to the committees. That means you're allowed to move certain legislation through committee or not through committee, which means certain laws get passed or not get passed, which means that businesses that are coming into North Carolina, you're dealing with those individuals directly. You can impact development. And these are part-time jobs, by the way. And I know you're, you're saying, well, you're talking about corruption. You're talking about cutting deals, perhaps. No, I'm not necessarily saying that because they have access to the business that they're going to subsequently Shave something up for themselves. What I am saying, though, is that power begets power. And these folks know this. So when you've been in control of all these things, generally speaking, for over 100 years, Jim Crow or no Jim Crow, rise of the New South as well as part of that, too. Charlotte up on the up and coming under Democratic governors, for the most part, under a Democratic House of Representatives, under a Democratic Senate, for the most part. Do you really think they want to continue this, especially after the Republicans redrew the map in 2010, after the Republicans started having supermajorities 
in the General Assembly after they finally got a Republican governor, which they probably should have had in 2008 if it wasn't for the Obama coattails? Come on. This ventriloquist dummy and all the attention coming to North Carolina is more than just about Moral Mondays. We could talk about the voter ID law in North Carolina, and perhaps I will, because I disagree with that law too. There are certain things that they did well. There are certain timelines they're building into that. But pre-registration, why are you going after that? Cutting down early voting times, why are you going after that? So there, there's arguments to be made there. There's, there's legitimacy in questioning some of that. I'll give you that. But I'm not going to sit here and say that Reverend Barber, A, saying that Tim Scott does nothing but parrot the talking points of the Tea Party, and then B, turning around and doing nothing but parroting the talking points of the Democratic Party whenever he's questioned about this, doesn't have something to do with politics in and of itself. Maybe not the primary reason, but it is in the stew. And by the way, if you just dip your spoon into it just a little bit and you're being objective, you will get a taste of it. I guarantee you it's a little bit more bitter then you want to admit whether you are a conservative or a Democrat because whether you're black or not, this is not a good indication of where we're going as a nation in 2014 as we just left the MLK Day of Service as we're heading into Black History Month. This is not the tone that we want. Here we go again, folks. When do we make our country better without going after each other in such a vicious way? What do you think? You know where to find me on Twitter. L-E-N-N-Y-M-C-A-L-L-I-S-T-E-R. Facebook, two walls, same name, same guy. Want to get your feedback? I will catch up to you on Thursday. I think it might be, if we've been talking about Moral Monday and Election Tuesday, I think Thursday is probably going to be Doobie Thursday. What am I talking about? You're going to have to catch up to me tomorrow on Get Right with Lenny McGallis. In the meanwhile, TCNGB, take care and God bless. Peace.